you know, your brain is just on fire. And so you just need to do something and, and it's not always the best thing. You know, for some people it could be eating. Uh, for other people it could just be drinking more or taking more of the drugs. For other people it could be, you know, acting out sexually in, inappropriately, doing all sorts of things. Um, so there's, there's a wide variety of manifestations of impulsive behavior. More often in, in my case, for sure, I got addicted to, to substances because of my impulsivity, because of my high sensation seeking uh, trait. I would like, I would uh, invest more time, energy, and you know, put myself into more and more dangerous situations to try to get some type of a high sensation payoff. So that was a big part of the impulsivity. Thanks for tuning in to the Elevation Recovery Podcast, your hub for addiction recovery strategies hosted by Chris Scott and Matt Finch. Welcome everybody to episode 268. My name is Matt Finch and I'm here with my friend and co-host Chris Scott who just came back from a really awesome uh, business trip to New York. I'm super jealous. I saw some of the pictures looked like fun and you were there Chris uh, probably pretty close to your old stomping grounds regarding uh, all the alcohol, binge drinking, then alcoholism, physiological dependence. Uh, and what led to that was probably a little bit of impulsivity. The reason I bring up that word is that's our topic today. Impulsivity and its relationship to addiction. Uh, since we don't have a lot of time, maybe we'll do this a part one because this is a huge topic. So we'll call this impulsivity and addiction part one. Uh, Wikipedia has an amazing page on impulsivity. So I'm just going to read a couple paragraphs and we're going to uh, talk about it. In psychology, impulsivity or impulsiveness is a tendency to act on a whim, displaying behavior characterized by little or no forethought, reflection, or consideration of the consequences. Impulsive actions are typically poorly conceived, <clears throat> uh, prematurely expressed, unduly risky, or inappropriate to the situation that often result in negative consequences which imperil long-term goals and strategies for success. Impulsivity can be classified as a multifactorial construct. A functional variety of impulsivity <clears throat> let's, blah, 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 has also been suggested, which involves action without much forethought in appropriate situations that can and does result in desirable consequences. When such actions have positive outcomes, they tend not to be seen as signs of impulsivity, uh, but as indicators of boldness, quickness, spontaneity, courageousness, or unconventionality. So I won't continue to read. It's, I highly recommend that page on Wikipedia. Uh, but what do you think, Chris? I'm like, as I talk about impulsiveness, and, and it goes on to say that impulsivity is uh, actions where you don't think about it too much, where there's some, there's some reward coming after, right? So that, when, I, yeah. when I used to drink, for example... So I start drinking or something that would get me start to get me energized and hypomanic from that hypomanic place. I'm all energized and activated and confident. I would make very impulsive decisions. Matter of fact, I was already very impulsive without substances and I'd go downhill skateboarding and almost die big wave surfing and almost die. Uh, just my loud mouth would get me into trouble and I'd almost get jumped, beat up by a bunch of people. Uh, so just all my life, even many years into addiction recovery, probably a few years ago, <laughs> finally, I began to really calm down the impulsiveness. Impulsiveness is hardcore uh, integrated with addiction. So substance use disorders, behavioral disorders, uh, impulsive shopping, impulsive gambling, impulsive drinking, impulsive drug using, impulsive uh, promiscuity. Um, it's just basically, I think the remedy to that, and we can get into that either in this episode or part two, the remedy would be things like patience, mindfulness, self-regulation, right? Having a um, kind of a, a, a break in between when you get the idea to do something or when somebody asks you to go do something, rather than just being impulsive and doing it without much forethought, without much thought into the short-term and long-term potential consequences, taking a break, separating it, and having a mindfulness element to where you actually have a pause in between these kind of sensations we're getting and in between how we're actually behaving. Right. Yeah. I think this is a big topic. So I, I think splitting it into part one and part two is a good idea. Um, you know, 
impulsivity is obviously at the heart of addiction and behavior. Uh, that you know, compulsive behavior is addiction in large part. Uh, and yet, when I think about you know, from my own perspective, biochemical repair, what are we what are we trying to fix? What are we trying to help? What kind of behavior seems to be most ameliorated with nutrient repair and the lifestyle uh, tools that we try to arm people with? You know, I think of things like low blood sugar. Right. And so when someone has low blood sugar because they've been drinking or because they're in withdrawal, it makes them more impulsive. I know that I'm more impulsive when I have low blood sugar. And obviously the thing I'm most likely to do impulsively is eat. But there are other things as well. Right. I'm, there's a, a paucity or a lack of dopamine when you have low blood sugar. Uh, and it can make you do things that you otherwise might not do. You might snap at someone. You might say something. Everyone knows, you know, if you get hangry, it's a very common thing. You get hangry and you snap at someone and, and later on you have to apologize, right? So that's like short-term impulsivity most people can relate to. What a lot of people don't realize is that alcohol is a highly refined sugar that causes a ridiculous roller coaster in blood sugar levels. You know, you drink and then you have an, an increase in blood sugar, insulin comes, wipes out the blood sugar, wipes out amino acids that are precursors for neurotransmitters like dopamine. Later on, you're low dopamine and you're low blood sugar. So that's just one pathway. Uh, in addition to that, you know, you would have um, like sleep deprivation, which is very common with addiction, maybe because you're up all night taking drugs or drinking, uh, or just the fact that, as we know from, uh, I can't remember the call, I think it's Dr. Uh, Matt Walker, who wrote Why We Sleep, just one drink disrupts your REM sleep. So imagine you're having 10 drinks or even five drinks, uh, or if you're like me, 20 or 30 drinks, night after night after night, you're getting basically no REM sleep, you're never rested, and we know that there is a, a correlation between impulsive behavior and sleep deprivation. Uh, there's lack of clarity. The prefrontal cortex doesn't function properly. So that's another, you know, it's a double whammy at that point. Actually, it's probably a triple, quadruple, quintuple whammy, you know, because there are other things going on, dysregulation of your stress hormones. So people who are drinking or using drugs have often had imbalances with cortisol, adrenaline, um, even on a neurotransmitter level, you have too much glutamate. So that's more brain electrical activity, which it would seem I haven't, I mean, I'm not a researcher, but I wouldn't be surprised to find that people with an excess of glutamate and a deficiency in GABA, GABA being the calming neurotransmitter, would be more likely to act impulsively, right? So you can, everyone knows who's, who's been a drinker, the feeling of being shaky or being frenetic. And that seems to be related to actions that can be impulsive that are taken in an effort to try to distract from that unpleasant uh, sort of manic state um, or just doing things because you're, you're, you know, your mind is like a, a, a pinball in a boxcar. I think someone said uh, recently, maybe it was BB. I can't recall old saying, but you know, your brain is just on fire. And so you just need to do something and, and it's not always the best thing. You know, for some people it could be eating uh, for other people it could just be drinking more or taking more of the drugs for other people it could be, you know, acting out sexually in, inappropriately, doing all sorts of things. Um, so there's there's a wide variety of manifestations of impulsive behavior. And I can recall when I, I worked in New York, which was my old stomping ground, and it's always funny to go back there. And I have, I have a sort of Zen now, and I've done yoga and meditation, and I read books before bed. I, I get, you know, seven to nine hours of sleep most of the time. I try to average eight, it's probably more like seven recently, um, but I'm in a much different mind space and my physiology is so different and I have no interest in immersing myself in the toxic alcohol mm -hmm. culture. It's such a noisy place compared to where I live now here in Savannah. You know, my blood pressure always comes down when, I, when I'm here, when I return here. But when I go there, you know, I, I start thinking of like some of the things that I did that seem insane. And I recall sitting in my office in New York um, and there was a Wendy's on the, in the basement floor. We were on like the 30th floor. And if I had bad enough withdrawal, you know, my hands are shaking and I'm trying to do spreadsheets at my desk. My boss was yelling or whatever. And I, I remember reaching the point frequently. I would say, I can't take this. It was too early to justify drinking at that time. But that's what, that's what I really wanted was to have a drink. But my best outlet for my impulsive energy was to take the elevator to the, the basement of the building, go into Wendy's and order like a, I don't know, egg sausage thing, biscuit thing, 
or maybe if I'd missed that, it was I would get some kind of ridiculous, you know, fast food cheeseburger situation with fries and always a Diet Coke. I was drinking Diet Cokes throughout the day, which in retrospect is appalling. But I would do that. I would have the the you know fried potatoes and the um, and the greasy meat or eggs or whatever, and the carbs, the processed carbs and all the grease. And that would just kind of like, oh, it, would, it would calm down my system for a minute. I didn't realize any of the things that I just said were going on. I just thought I was defective or that I was stupid or that I was immoral, that I couldn't handle myself. And I had to go down and, and I would literally sit in the corner. I remember once I had colleagues that were walking somewhere, they'd probably gotten gone to have a, a meeting at some, uh, you know, healthy breakfast place and they were returning <laughs> and I was sitting in this Wendy's alone and I was wearing my suit and I, and I saw them coming. I ducked under the table because I didn't want them to see me stuffing my face with Wendy's, you know, for, for no reason alone. Uh, so yeah, that was, that was embarrassing. So you, you said that you had been stung by a bee earlier, which is never fun. And I recounted the time, uh, actually during early recovery when I was still rebalancing and not quite in my right mind. And, I was impulsive in certain ways for weeks or maybe months after I quit drinking. And I recall uh, there was a wasp's nest in the apartment that I lived in, in Atlanta. And I did something that I wouldn't do now, although it was kind of comical in retrospect. And I, I had a tennis racket and I just approached the wasp nest with the tennis racket and just, you know, bam, bam. All of a sudden there's 15 wasps flying around. I felt like Luke Skywalker just killing these wasps. It's a miracle I didn't get stung. I probably killed 15 wasps, uh, but I was so like, I had so much pent up en energy and uh, I felt so impulsive that it seemed like the obvious solution, you know, rather than ask my roommate if we can carefully try to throw this thing out the window, which is where it was. I think I, I dented the molding with the tennis, probably, you know, messed up my tennis racket trying to kill this this thing. We could have we could have more calmly removed it or trapped it in a bag and, and sealed it. But I wanted to go you know toe to toe with all of these wasps, uh, and it was it's kind of dumb in retrospect. But that that was my mind state at the time, and so we don't often examine what state of mind we're in, either in a short term or a long term sense. I know that I didn't back when I was drinking or with early recovery. I just always took for granted that if I felt a certain way then you know that's just that's just the way i was and i'd never looked into the biochemical cues uh, or potential solutions which maybe we can leave for next time to kind of rewire yourself out of that mind state which i bumbled into unintentionally for the most part mm -hmm. a big part of it was nutrient repair uh, but also things like yoga and meditation and getting really good sleep for a long time yeah and it's like a a kind of negative downward spiral feedback loop as well with the impulsivity and addiction uh, for some people maybe they get addicted to you know a prescription medicine or something but they were never impulsive before start taking a pain medicine you know like a narcotic opioid pain medicine a couple months later they find out they're not just physically hooked but psychologically hooked then all of a sudden they they're also struggling with trying to quit impulsivity compulsivity so it can like totally destroy people's self-regulation more often in, in my case, for sure. I got addicted to, to substances because of my impulsivity, because of my high sensation seeking uh, trait. I would like I would uh, invest more time, energy and, you know, put myself into more and more dangerous situations to try to get some type of a high sensation payoff. So that was a big part of the impulsivity. ADHD and impulsivity are basically married. That's like the uh, the biggest thing about ADHD is like, you know, your prefrontal cortex is just not centered, not stabilized, and you're just like fidgety and can't sit still. And that was me all growing up, just ADHD. I would cut people off when talking, getting really excited. I was extremely impatient. My family and friends they used to like make fun of me and sometimes they'd get pissed off. Sometimes it was lighthearted making fun of me. Other times it was getting pissed off because I was so impatient. I was so impatient. It was ridiculous. My severe hypoglycemia uh, exacerbated that impatience big time. Like you, I didn't know about the biochemical things going on. I didn't know that you could like, you know, have a growth mindset. I was angry at God a lot 
for giving me what I felt was a, a shitty hand for life. You know, I was like, and I would just like kind of list off all these um, kind of defects that I had. There were so many. And I was angry at God because of those. How come this, that? And I was pissed off at the world. I didn't think things were fair. Uh, I was just really like, pour me, pour me, pour me another drink, uh, pour me another uh, beer, pop another bunch of pills, you know, do some other drugs. And yeah, like you were saying, meditation, yoga. In part two, we can talk all about the neurotransmitters and therapies, but I think a lot of people are resonating with this big time right now, whereas they've got like this finite amount of self-control per day. And, you know, maybe people can do good for a while, a day or two days, a week. Say somebody quits drinking and they're doing good for a week, but then they have to make all these like tough decisions, get, get through all these challenges. And then one day their self-control just runs out. They get in a big argument with their wife or husband and things are really bad. They had a shitty day at work. All of a sudden, now their self-control is depleted. They have none left. They go out to dinner with a friend, one of their old drinking buddies. And they're like, come on, you can have one glass of red wine. Come on, you can just drink one. The self-control, the willpower, the ego's dead for that point. You just have no protection. Then all of a sudden, you drink. So like that Wikipedia page, I can't wait. We'll read more on the next episode, but. Definitely wanted to mention bipolar, uh, bipolar disorder and impulsivity, addiction, like we said, and ADHD. Those are kind of three that are just married to impulsivity, compulsivity, uh, and they all kind of exacerbate each other. It's like then it becomes which came first, the chicken or the egg? Did the impulsiveness come first? There's even impulsive. There's a new scale that I found, too, a new online assessment. You know how much I love assessments. There's a new assessment that I found. Well, I'm not sure if it's new, but it's new to me on impulsivity. You can actually score yourself. And there's even an impulsivity uh, disorder in the DSM-5. So this is like huge. When you look at it, just America, many other countries too, you know, the UK, Australia, so many people, alcohol addictions. I was just looking at uh, drug addictions. I was just looking at statistics in the past. I think it was 10 years. It showed state by state in the U.S. the increases in alcohol-related deaths. And most states were more than 100% increase in just alcohol-related deaths. Some of the states were like almost 300% increase. You know, North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Missouri, Wyoming, I think were some of the highest ones. That book that I just read recently by uh, Dr. Anna Lemke, Dopamine Nation, finding balance in an age of indulgence. That's that's what's making it so hard for so many of us. We got our smartphones. We've got our laptops, our desktops. We've got our smart TVs uh, and more, you know, all sorts of different gadgets and gadgets, tings, bings, rings, alerts going off, text messages, emails. So all these things are competing for our attention. And a lot of these things can debilitate, decrease, our self-control, our willpower for the day. So the more of these things that we do and the less we're conscious and intentional about conserving our energy and our focus, likely the more impulsive we're going to be. People trying to quit drugs or alcohol, if they quit getting through post-acute withdrawal, my guess is this, then I'll let you, let you talk on this, Chris. What do you think about this relationship? The more impulsivity a person has, the more likely they are to relapse during the post-acute withdrawal phase. So like if somebody's like a 99 on the scale of impulsivity, good luck getting all the way through the post-acute withdrawal process if that's going to take a while. And then the less impulsive somebody is, probably the, uh, the less difficult to make it through. Sure. But I would add a caveat, which is it's important not to define yourself by your worst state. Mm -hmm. And so, and at my worst, I was the most impulsive person I knew, especially when it came to drinking. When mm -hmm. I told my family and friends that I needed to quit, my parents drove several hours out to see me. And within an hour or two, I was at a bar drinking. And that's so not me. Wow. That's not my character. And they were panicked because they didn't know where I was. I disappeared. I lost my sense of time. Uh, I, I can't say I was having a great time, but I was, I don't really recall it. To be honest, it was a blur, but I was having apparently the kind of time where I had no concern with time. 
And that is so not me. I know that that's not my best self. That's not my true self. So I, I don't want people to confuse their worst states that are caused by a complex array of biochemical and psychological, social and spiritual factors with who they actually are. So, yeah, I was extremely impulsive. Uh, I might not have been as impulsive as other people, interestingly, except when it came to alcohol uh, in other ways, in most other ways in, in, my, in high school and college. You know, I think that's an interesting thing with you and I, where we have different stories in that regard, because it, for me, it was like alcohol was the one thing. It was my kryptonite that was holding me mm -hmm. back from being a really high performer in a bunch of things. And yet it really did hold me back and it almost killed me in my 20s. Uh, and, you know, I get to to detox and rehab and they're telling me I have the the liver of an old man and I'm I'm just uh -huh. You know, and my brain is probably a disaster and I have one of the worst cases of, of alcohol addiction that they've seen and someone my age. Uh, and so it was a really, a, a really odd thing for me to have to deal with, knowing that I had had typically been, except for the alcohol, pretty centered, pretty motivated, pretty successful in things that I decided to do and pretty not impulsive, not really taken in by the allure of various things. I didn't really misbehave or, or uh, party too much in high school. I did in college, but that was a, an alcohol thing. You know, and I, I wasn't even when I was blackout drunk, I somehow wasn't getting in trouble hmm. because I had, I just didn't, I didn't have the desire to do ridiculous stuff. Now, did I do ridiculous stuff? I'm sure. Did I, do I remember all of it? Probably not. Would I look back and, and be appalled? I'm sure. Uh, but then again, I wouldn't be appalled because I don't, I don't, I don't see any value in in castigating ourselves in retrospect. It's all just part of the story. It's part of the journey. It's part of the adventure. And if you emerged, if you had close calls and you emerged and you're still alive, then you have to be grateful. And that actually leads to something else I wanted to say, because I touched on some of my speculative, hypothetical uh, biochemical pathways about with, with impulsivity and addiction. We know that it's both a precondition and a result of addiction. So if you go into addiction impulsive, you're probably going to come out more impulsive. Mm -hmm. And if you go into addiction not being inherently impulsive, except maybe with that particular substance like I did, you're going to come out potentially generally impulsive like I did. So it's an interesting relationship. But psychologically, I'm trying to think what what were the psychological characteristics that I displayed that may have heightened my impulsivity during my drinking years uh, and maybe during po and post acute withdrawal as well. And I'm thinking, you know, things like uh, an absence of compassion towards myself, being really hard on myself made me psychologically desire an outlet or a dopamine release to the extent that you feel like you're in some kind of malevolent universe where you can't get what you want. You're going to settle for quick wins, short term pleasure boosts, and then you end up doing impulsive things. A lack of gratitude as well. And gratitude is a word I found it to be woo woo. Back in my drinking years, I'd hear yogis talking about gratitude and they were like, they have too much time on their hands to get back to work, whatever. Gratitude is extremely important. And I think it's relevant here because if you can't be, and this is very common, and I have to continually remind myself on a daily basis to be grateful for what I have. But if, you, if you're incapable of being happy with who you are and what you do have, rather than focusing on what you don't have and, what, and, on, and on what you're not, then you're going to... Well, you could have a variety of responses, but it, you could be overtake, overcome with that defeatist mentality where you're focusing on what you don't have and, and, and attributes or things, physical things or relationships that you, that you don't have. And you think, oh, you know, to hell with all of it. And I'm going to go get ice cream or alcohol or, you know, risky sex or whatever, the, whatever it is, heroin. Um, and I think that, that there is a lack of gratitude there. And so now every morning I think of three things I'm grateful for as soon as I wake up and it really colors the rest of my day. I have a lot of my private clients do that as well. And it's a good antidote for anxiety just to think of the things, focus on the things you're grateful for. Mm -hmm. As Tony Robbins says, and I've said this a million times, I've repeated it a million times, we feel what we focus mm -hmm. on. So if we're focusing on an abyss or on an absence, then we're going to have a desire to fill ourselves with whatever it is we don't have or with whatever it is that we can obtain really quickly to make us feel better about not having it. So I think gratitude is, is relevant there as well. And then there are other things such as trying to, um, you know, form a space between, this is a, actually from a Yogi book, the 
I can't pronounce his name, uh, Shad Guru, a uh, book I'm reading, but trying to have a space in between, you know, you, who you are, which is not your body, it's not your brain with racing thoughts. It is a, an eternal entity, consciousness, right? And we can say this without being too woo woo, but you can think of yourself, all right, so I am a being. I am, if you identify with your consciousness, you can create a space between that and your racing thoughts on your aching or throbbing uh, or otherwise hyperactive manic body, body brain system. And in that space, there is room to uh, free yourself a bit. I think free will probably resides in that space. And you can kind of look at yourself in the third person, not in a scary, depersonalized way, you know, like someone who's too high and they see them, you know, there's third person mm -hmm. uh, thoughts, but in a, in a, in a calming way. And you can, start analyzing, you know, how am I feeling right now? And, and why am I feeling that way? Is it, is it situational? Is it biochemical? What's the state of my body? Why is my mind racing? And you calm things down and try to assess things rationally. I think logic can actually be of use uh, if we're trying to you know, determine our own best course of action. Everything we do is a trade-off and there's a layer of free will in everything we do. But if we don't exercise it, and a lot of us have strong dopamine laced neural pathways associated with various activities. If we're in a habit of not exercising our logic or free will uh, or gratitude or self-compassion or compassion for other people, then we're just going to be automatons and we're hmm. going to be biological soup that goes towards what it hmm. wants, you know, like two magnets coming together. But there is that space in which there is free will and there are methods by which to uh, increase that space. So I, I don't know that I just gave a, an effective uh, vision for someone for or, or strategy for how to utilize that. But uh, I think, as we mentioned in the beginning, meditation, yoga, gratitude, these are really good uh, psychological or psychobiological methods mm -hmm. for trying to increase your free will. Right on. And I know you got to go in a few minutes here. So we'll just end with <clears throat> this. The number one, this is the part one of the session. Tune in to part two of this. Uh, before we leave, I'll say that impulsivity, the one of the main reasons I was impulsive for so many decades, actually, I didn't feel comfortable in my own skin and I didn't feel comfortable in my own mind, my own thoughts, just what you were saying right there. And it was only when I started to ascend levels of consciousness and be able to not just be an automaton, I love that word for it, where you're just kind of just going like through the motions and all these things happen and you're just living in re unconscious, reactionary, uh, chronic stress uh, mode of living, high impulsivity, automaton, uh, self-hypnosis. So you can break out of the self-hypnosis. You can break out of the impulsivity trait, habit, uh, consequence of addiction, whatever. And you can become much more present, much more confident, centered, extremely grateful and comfortable and joyous and ecstatic in your own skin, in your own mind, especially knowing that we're not the body or the mind. We are the eternal consciousness that was never, never born, can never die. Energy, light photon energy can't be destroyed. Energy can only be changed in some way. So here we are these kind of cool characters in this wonderful simulation, the consciousness controlling the mind and the body. We're all going around and it's a fun path to be on. Meditation, Qigong, Tai Chi, deep tissue massage. And we're going to talk about all sorts of other things in part two, neurofeedback training, uh, uh, certain essential oils and combinations and many other ways that you can actually repair this impulsivity that continues to make your life either get out of control or maybe you'll get some success and then you'll slip back on a drinking or drugs due to impulsivity, at least in part, maybe in large part. And so thanks so much for joining us. We love you guys so much and we'll see you next time.